All right, guys. Welcome to another episode of, I don't even know what we're calling this, Fishing Forecast. <laughs> Today we have Coach on the line again, and we're going to talk about your guys' fishing and dive conditions for the coming week. Coach, take it away. Well, uh, we're going to look first here at our tides, because that's pretty much whether you're a diver or whether you're a shore fisherman, or even if you're a pelagic fisherman, they play a role. So here coming into this next weekend, we got uh, we got highs and uh, high around sunrise, and then we have another one about three hours after dark or so. Uh, kind of not prime tides for what I do for the saltwater panfish in the winter, but uh, this might actually work out for divers, depending on where your location is and how much salad was kicked up by those huge waves this week. So things to keep in mind are how big has the surf been? How big is it going to be? And what kind of high tides do you have? Because the bigger of a high tide, the bigger of waves you have, the closer those waves are together, the more grass is going to get ripped off and get fl floated out into the water. So and you, when you see those big black mats and the waves are all black, that is a bad time if you're a shore fisherman every time. Does this kind of stuff lead to better uh, like patties out and about when you have these kind of swells? Do they yes. Nice. It is a little bit early, but yes, this big winter storms create patties for sure. And ideally, if, when you, if you want to have the biggest patties, you want really big waves for a very short time, followed by really southerly currents that'll push them out into the bite. So that current will sweep up against shore, that kelp will be getting ripped off, and that same current that's pushing you against the shore will eventually sweep out to sea, and that's where the patties come from. I had no idea. Keep in mind, yeah, keep in mind that a lot of our patties are generated by Northern Baja, by that very process. So something to keep in mind for sure. Learn something new every day. <laughs> well, the islands... <clears throat> Sorry, I inhaled some chemical at work the other day. My lungs hurt me a little. It'll oh, be no. a couple weeks till I heal up. You guys uh, get to hear me stop coughing. <clears throat> as long as it's not anyways, the mid. No, not that I... I don't think so. I'm pretty sure this is a uh, really concentrated version of pine saw we use for disinfecting playgrounds. But anyways. So, uh, I mean, heading into our weekend here, you got... You got the midday is looking not real nice for what you and I do, John, for sure. You want to be out there early or late. That's what I think. Right. Makes maybe sense. even maybe even later later on in the day, after that low tide starts turning around and filling back in, maybe swim out to meet that if you're out diving or for shore fishing, it's gonna to be tough. You're gonna to need a little deeper area because you got a sunset at four forty seven. But uh, I did catch a couple fairly decent caligos the other day after dark on uh on a uh, lower, on a dropping tide. So <clears throat> you just yeah, have to see how the tides, tides work out for whatever spots you're fishing. None of these tides up until next Tuesday, Wednesday look that attractive. I mean, maybe Wednesday morning, uh, but we'd have to see the swell. Yeah. Because the waves are just ridiculous. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of far out to predict it. And those swells yeah. the last 48 hours have been absolutely insane. So. There's probably going to be a lot of crud on the beach. There's going to be all kinds of grass and kelp, all kinds of stuff on the beach after after the weather event we just had, for sure. Yeah, just based on this, I would, yeah, I don't like to make predictions past four or five days, and I didn't even look anything good until <laughs> seven days, so I don't know, maybe it's it's all just a little surf fishing if, there's, if your conditions allow it. <laughs> no diving for a while. Yeah, I was going to head out tonight, but the razor won over the fishing pole. I said, ah, man, I need to cut all this facial hair off. So, <laughs> Well, don't have a first-hand report for me from this week, other than uh, I went the other day. Conditions were bad. Sand had filled in one of my big opal eye holes. I was really kind of bummed to see that. And uh, so we went into a deep water spot, and I bagged a few calicos on the outgoing. But nice. rough. It's, I think it's going to be an ugly winter for me. Ooh. How about temp? What is, what's the temp look like? So, look. Uh, we're looking at temp break right now. So, you know, for all you island hopping guys, it's still in the, uh, 62, 63 range. It warmed back up, up there mm -hmm. along, uh, Marina del Rey. And even off of Newport and Dana, you got some warm spots. Uh, it warmed back up down here to the South. So probably party boat fishing will pick up. If that big swell didn't shut all this down, there's no guarantees it didn't, but assuming that big swell didn't reorder things from this SST, I think we're good. And so that means there's probably still there's probably still Patty Yellows and Opa on the bite here on the islands. Tanner and Cortez look like they'd still be holding those uh, big bluefin they were, they've been holding most of the year. 
and farther south along the 60 and uh boomerang down here kind of uh west of puerto salino out here it's looking pretty good i think there's still a possibility of local tuna for the, the san diego party boat guys maybe the maybe the 085 can get on a few i'm oh, sorry 095 i apologize for those of you who are fans of that boat san nicholas though but, it's looking uh, a little chilly still that's good. It's yeah. a good thing for your trip. That nice cold water will pull those rockfish right off the bottom where you can get at them easier. Ooh, ooh. Exciting. So instead of having to fish tight to the bottom like you would during warmer warmer water, you can crank your lure and, you know, if you're using like a jig and fly or something like that, mm -hmm. you pull it up in the water column a few feet off that structure and they'll they'll be floating up there ready to grab as it comes by. Good to know. I'm going to have to try that. For Ling, though, the bad news is it still helps to be on bottom. So, if you go that route. I think I, my mission is Ling first, Rockfish second. <laughs> I need I need the Ling. It's just a, it's been bothering well, me. Be ready for the grind, grind because you're going to be on it, I yep, think. Exactly. As long as you're, as long as you're focused, I think, I think you won't have a problem. You might have to grind away at it. Yep. But. Definitely plenty of links at uh, Nick to be had for sure. Exactly. What's the uh, next tab? So it's uh, we're still on temp break, but this is the chloro charts. Ooh. See, it's pretty. See, it's pretty green out here off of uh, Nick, or at least somewhat green. That I mean, really green is out here, but yeah. On the overall, most of your shore diving spots look pretty good up here in the Malibu area, and then uh, you know PV along here looks pretty good. You know, you got some nice clarity out down here by Newport and uh, down here south of Oceanside. La Jolla looks pretty good for the guys that go out down there. So for the guys who have never seen this chart <laughs> but, before, what are they looking for? Well, the darker green water is concentrations of chlorophyll. And usually this is wind wind driven, not really wind generated. but So the areas that are clearer tend to be areas where water is being pulled up from deeper. And then areas that are greener tend to be areas where the surface water is allowed to sit. Gotcha. To one degree, to one degree or another, that's typically what you see. Usually, these weird swirls and lines out here are wind lines. And uh, yeah, you know, we kind of mentioned the chloro last week, but uh, sometimes the pelagic predators will hang on one side of the chloro or the other and target the other side, depending on which side the bait's on. They use that line as camouflage see it a lot not so much for rockfish but for the pelagics makes sense and then for a for a diver would they be saying like oh this green is kind of uh you know a bad well, you thing can definitely have or? two green you can definitely have two green right in here off the off the lighthouse right here is probably pretty darn green in the san pedro buoy makes sense this is pretty darn, pretty darn dark green. But at the same time, right up here off PV, <clears throat> assuming I even remember where PV is, I think it's right here. No, you nailed it. <laughs> not, That's our it's PV not is. point. Yeah, it's it's right here. Right? Yeah, okay. So PV. Yeah. So right here on PV, you know, you could be if it's a little green where you're diving, maybe go a little farther north if it's not in the MLPA, and uh, you might find some cleaner water. <clears throat> How about in to Malibu up north? I think I, I can only see up to Marina. Uh, so, Ooh. so there's Harrison's right there. Yeah, you, know, well, you you've got a pretty clean stretch all along here. Yeah. Even this doesn't look too bad until you start coming back towards MDR. Yep. Well, I think based on the tide, it's still not going to uh, matter much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, either the tide's going to beat you up, these big waves are going to beat you up, or the water's going to be so full of salad, it's going to be hard to swim. Please be careful yeah. with the thick grass. I've seen people trying to get out past it and really struggle and get caught up in it before if you're heading out, people. Just just a word of advice if you're willing to take it. Absolutely. Perfect. So what's the next one? Water temp? <laughs> or not water temp. Uh... Uh, so, we, uh, so I pulled up a forecast here. And I just chose Monterey Bay just to get a little view on something different. So tonight there's their swell is only six to eight feet, which in the last couple of days it's been as high as 16. Uh, Grab the surfboard. Grab the gun. Yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, maybe. But by the weekend, it starts settling down into the four-foot range. Picks up a little bit on Saturday night and Sunday. And then uh, it, it, right by Sunday night, it's getting big again, like eight or nine feet. Which, four to five feet is pretty good for them up there. Once it gets like seven feet and higher, they get jacked. So this is kind of what a forecast looks like right here. So tonight, it's a south-southwest five to eight. Uh, variable after midnight. Mostly cloudy swell, 6 to 8 and 14 seconds, which does not sound very pleasant to me. Uh, wind waves around 1 foot. So, yeah, that's... Man, I don't think I'd want to be out there in that. I probably wouldn't want to be shore fishing in that. No, that but, uh, you know... Yeah, I mean, there, there are diehards that can do it. and You know, they push themselves. But, you know, if you're not real aware of what you're doing, I wouldn't head out in weather like this. I certainly wouldn't do it at my age, for sure. When I was a younger man, well. <laughs> How do you, past 30? 32? <laughs> yeah. I'm at least 29. <laughs> I remember being brave and running out onto the rocks and casting in the dark with lightning going, but yeah, I wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, you got wise. Actually, <laughs> wise or stupid, either way. <laughs> so uh, here's the fish counts for Cisco's, and this is out of, uh, this is out of Oxnard. And I kind of wanted to go back to December 6th to like show a, they, they had a pretty nice run today actually, but I kind of wanted to go back to the last weekend so we could like see what kind of offerings they have. So, I mean, it's pretty much limit style rockfish and whitefish for the most part. I mean, or, or, you know, plenty of nice rockfish and whitefish with a few lings and sculpin and sheephead mixed in. But, I mean, even the Mirage didn't pull any, you know, huge uh, halibut numbers or anything like that. But, I mean, still, it's still a great boat. But, I mean, when you're pulling near limits of ling, sheephead, whitefish, and rockfish, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty nice overnight. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Again, again, you know, your three-quarter day range. A little bit less, but still very nice numbers. You know, even on the half day, you know, you're still pulling eight fish a guy yeah i mean really not not a big deal but uh you know when you look at the dock totals five boats 102 anglers eight lings six sheep 383 whitefish 743 rockfish and four skull and that's some pretty crazy numbers if you ask me yeah they put in yeah. some serious work right there yep these boys know their business for sure what's the last and time? then here's our so this one here is our uh OSPO, NOAA, uh, sea surface temperature charts. So this kind of shows you where Southern California gets its water from. <clears throat> the arrow is kind of hovering. I'll, I'll go back to a bigger map of this in just a minute. But, you know, we have another big batch of warm water that looks like it's headed towards SoCal or that it's going to be close. We might get a – we might – I mean, I'm hesitant to call it, but we might get a real nice end-of-the-season rush – for a few days on some nice yellowfin or maybe even Dorado or I mean, who knows, but it looks like there's some really nice weather coming up the line. If this uh, wind slacks off enough to let it get here, we could be doing pretty good here in another week or two. Oh man. Do I need to get down there? Do I need to get down to San Diego? Shoot. Uh, that's a tough call. Uh, personally, I'd rather come up and fish with you, but that's a different story. Well, we got the boat. So man. as you can let's see, get, the, let's get it out there. <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, this uh, what I always call the arrow. It kind of wanders around a little bit, but this arrow often points almost dire either directly to or almost directly to Cabo San Lucas, which is why the fishing is so fantastic down there. But uh, right now, it's it's still hovering. We're still seeing some influence on our local water off of this thing. So. I mean, there might be some tuna to be had. There might be some late season bonitos. I mean, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But one thing I've always found interesting is the same water that's down here is out here. You know, you got to go down Baja a long way to find water that would be out here. You know, two, yeah. three hundred miles away. It's an interesting thing. It makes you wonder. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so I want to do a quick little clinic because. Uh, you guys are heading out on the El Dorado out of Long Beach tomorrow night for an overnight going after wings and rockfish at St. Nick or San Nick. Um, Coach, what, what do you think I should try 
recommend. I know we've talked about it offhand, but I figured we should kind of share a little bit of these things with the guys listening. Well, I mean, it really depends on what you want to do, right? The old uh, jig and feather, for example. So you have a feather 18 inches above some sort of jig, either a diamond jig or a hair jig, or even just uh, like a big lead head with a squid skirt on it. Or it could even be like a big swim bait, something like that. So then you're kind of targeting both sides, right? Does anybody so, ever use a, a bucktail out there for this stuff? They they were they were popular in years gone by. I haven't seen too many in the last few years I've been heading out. Of course, that doesn't mean they haven't made a resurgence of popularity. Okay. But the bucktail is a great jig. Mm-hmm. So good jigs never die. No, I believe uh, a bone surface iron that worked great in 1920 will probably still work great today. Okay. Old have... lures still catch fish. So go on ahead, Dirt John. I don't know. I was just thinking because I mean I remember I, I did really well last season or last time I was on this boat with the diamond rig that ahi assault you gave me. I mean I pulled some pretty good size vermilion, some chucky chuckies. So but I ne- I just forgot to use my bucktail out there. I always, I know that live bait usually reign supreme and that's what all the deckhands always you know yell at most of the guys to to keep using but i always just like to at some point mess around <laughs> with whatever i got in, in my uh tackle boxes to kind of try it you know just to make sure that i'm you know testing out different things for myself personally so well, i'm just curious on what well there's on nothing that. well there's nothing wrong with running your whichever type of loop you want above your uh above your bucktail use Mm -hmm. your bucktail and then put live bait on your loop above i like that Um, i think i'll try that yeah i did none of that last time and you know i (laughs) well i mean i use a dropper loop you know it's like i'll do a a double dropper loop with two sardines on it or you know sometimes uh a single dropper loop but i never really put a a heavy lure below and then have you know the thing at the top like I, like I didn't even do that with the uh, diamond jig, and I think that would just be cool to try because I've never tried it. And I also want to try your your well, uh, recommendation for the the uh, rock he- uh, rockfish carcass and drop that sucker down just for fun to see if that works. Yeah, I mean, if if there's any mackerel in the tank, fillet one side, hook it through the head with a big lead head, and then put the put the strip on your dropper, and you know, it's it's fairly easy. Okay, yeah, I'll nothing that. nothing real. Com- I mean. Not not a complicated rig, but then you're splitting the difference, and you know you got that the shot at that big ling grabbing a hold of that carcass, mm-hmm. and then and you uh, said, so put then you got a nice the, strip. The lead head through the nose or through the whole thing, like yeah, I, I would run it right through the skull. Okay, I would run it right okay. through the skull, right through the middle part of the head. Perfect, and then balance it on bottom, and then above it you have a feather with a long strip of mackerel on it. Can't go wrong. I love it, man. I want to try these. I love the new, I love these, uh, you know, different types of methods. Well, just because it's not done now doesn't mean it wasn't done once upon a time. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And then gear wise, you won't see very many. Yeah, no, I believe you. I, I wouldn't, I mean, 40 to 50 pound gear is perfect. I mean, even an old, you know, here in SoCal fashion is king, right? You know, if you don't have that Tranks on that Phoenix Feather Ulta Black Diamond Super, I mean, whatever combination of words you want. But in reality, those old four out reels loaded with 40 and 50 pound mono or, you know, Dacron or, you know, any sort of modern day line too. I mean, for bottom fishing, I don't mind recommending the super lines new people as long as they've been out a little bit so they're capable of doing the line management part of the equation mm-hmm. well i'm a i'm just a i mean if it's your person. first first time <laughs> i'm going with my newell i'm going hey. with the newell the 533 with the 50 pound mono straight now i'm not going to care <laughs> I don't do perfect I don't do it's special. a great it's a great reel it's a great yeah. reel you know, a lot of guys bag on the old pens and point the finger and talk about drag capacities and, oh, you can't do this and blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, I've heard it all a million times. The other day when I was worried that we were going to get some divers munched, uh, we talked about this last time, but the kid walked up to me and he's like, well, 
that reel, and he's pointing to one of the six hots, it's only got like 17 pounds of drag, so you guys can't be fishing anything that big. And I'm like, uh, how hard do you think you can pull? <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, if it really came down to a contest with you and a fish, how hard can you pull? For how long? <laughs> the kid had no idea. Yeah. I'm like, I doubt you can pull. I mean, I'm looking at you right now, and I don't think you can pull 12 pounds for more than 10 minutes. I mean, he was totally dumb, but nobody had ever meant. (laughs) Well, I mean, nobody had ever even talked to the guy about like, how hard can you pull on a fish? So, I mean, don't underestimate those old pens that were in grandpa's garage. If you got a couple old senators in there that work just fine, load them up with some 40, 50, 60 pound line, the old pen 113s or whatever. I mean, by all means. And do you just go easy, straight? Easy as pie. For your drop dropper loop, do you just go straight whatever the main line is, the 50 pound, or do you do any kind of leader? Yeah. I mean, you can tie all kinds of complicated leaders, but I mean, really, that's for the guys who are really into it. Yeah. And I mean, they might give you advantages in certain situations, or, you know, you can do a solid ring with like a double bypass or something. But I mean, by the time you're getting into bypass rigs, you don't need my advice. <laughs> you know what I mean? I get it. <laughs> Well, coach, man, I really do appreciate it. Sorry we have to cut this one short, guys, but I, I have to run and work on the house. Um, coach, is there anything else you want to leave everybody with? Uh, yeah, if you have any questions or you want to uh, want anything further, hit me up on Worf TV on YouTube or you can get a hold of me on SD Fish. If you make a post, I'll find it. I'm sort of, uh, yeah, a fixture over there. Uh, if you're on any of the on any of uh, RCV stuff, MMFC or whatever, you can hit me up there. Anyways, it's been a pleasure, John. Take care of yourself, man. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, everybody listening. Make sure you subscribe, hit that like button. I'll put a link to uh, Coach's channel in the description. Until next time, tie lines, everyone. See ya.